You're watching America's Forum on Newsmax TV. I'm J.D. Hayworth. And I'm John Bachman. J.D., we talked a lot about the Senate races in 2014. Let's talk about some of those gubernatorial races, and one in particular, and that's Florida. The race for the governor's mansion in Tallahassee might be one of the most closely watched contests this election cycle. The man who once resided in that mansion, Charlie Chris, hope to, hopes to move back in, but he'll have to kick out the guy who's living there right now, current Florida Governor Rick Scott. Chris' campaign also faces some intra-party pressure. Florida Senate Democratic leader Nan Rich wants to take on Scott, too. Rich has been slamming Chris for spending most of his political life as a Republican and naming conservatives to the Florida Supreme Court. High-profile Democrats, Florida Democrats, like Debbie Wasserman Schultz, not really taking sides just quite yet. Wasserman Schultz claims that the election is really about Rick Scott's failures. So, joining us right now to talk about this race, George Lemieux, a former U.S. Senator appointed to that seat by Charlie Chris. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you. George, let's just get it on the record. Okay. In the governor's race, who do you endorse this year? Oh, I'm supporting Rick Scott. I was on Rick's transition team. Um, I think he's doing a great job for Florida. Since he's been governor, we've had a huge growth in jobs in this state, more than 500,000 new jobs. He's been able to uh, retire debt increased funding to education. Florida now is a hot place for businesses to come from around the country. So I think he's done a very good job and I'm supporting him in his campaign. Yeah, a lot of people didn't think that Rick Scott was gonna be able to make that campaign promise of 700,000 jobs in seven years. And so far he's well above that track. Rick Scott's uh, approval ratings also starting to come around a little bit as well, closing the gap on Charlie Chris. And I think the most recent poll that I saw within the margin of error here, do you think uh, people are focusing too much on Charlie Crist's approval ratings while he was governor and not about how much he, he had, how much trouble he had when he ran against Marco Rubio. Well, the race really isn't defined yet. So Charlie Crist is an amorphous figure in Florida politics. People like him because they have a, a kind of a personal connection with him. But as the race d gets defined with spending on television, other types of campaigning, you're going to see Democrats supporting Charlie, Republicans supporting Rick. But I think the record of the two is really going to be the big part of the election. You're going to see a record of success with Rick Scott. And unfortunately, in the last few years during the Christ uh, administration, things were very bad in Florida. And if you listen mm -hmm. to Rick Scott, he says, you know, here we are, a no state income tax state, a right to work state, one of the most beautiful places in the country. Yet we were the worst state in the recession. Why was that? He says a failure of leadership. I think that's what the campaign and debate will be about. Now, an interesting situation for you, George, because at one point you served as chief of staff mm -hmm. to Charlie mm -hmm. Crist. Indeed, people look back at Charlie's time as governor. They said, you know, George Lemieux really gave Charlie some advice. But there's something that Charlie seems to have that's innate, and that is people skills. By that, I mean he is always the hail fellow well met. He seems to remember everybody. and. While I personally like Governor Scott and find him very engaging, the public perception among Floridians I've spoken to is, for whatever reason, a kind of standoffishness from Rick Scott. So given Charlie's people skills, how does Governor Scott have his, his time in office transcend the likability factor for Charlie? Well, I think what Rick has to do and what he's starting to do by being on television now is tell the story. Tell the story of Florida's return, Florida's success, what he's been able to do to help create jobs in the state, get people back to work. You know, he says, I think, uh, very rightly, that the most important thing for any person is to have a job. Once you have a job, you can take care of your family. Once you have a job, you can provide for your family, for your kids' education, all the things that a good parent wants to do. So he's been laser focused on creating those jobs. You're going to see a lot of television in this race. They've already uh, gone on uh, the air for the Let's Get to Work folks who support mm -hmm. Rick Scott's reelection. I suspect that they will really not go off the air until the November election date. And the question will, will be how much money will Charlie Crist have to combat that message? Because as good as a people person as Charlie Crist is, you can't meet enough people in Florida. The state's just too big. There's more than, I think, 11.7 million voters, 19.5 million people. If you go and you meet 5,000 people a day, you still can't meaningfully yeah. affect the electorate. I think eight TV markets, too, which makes it really complicated to buy those ads. Uh, you know, this issue, and we saw this come up in the special congressional election for the 13th District, these uh, Medicare cuts. So mm -hmm. much of that was made about the, the Medicare Advantage cuts. Um, and we've seen Charlie Chris not afraid to run with Obamacare in this election. Is he going to regret that decision, saying that he embraces Obamacare fully? It's the most unusual political tactic this cycle. If you watch the Democrats who are running for re-election to the U.S. Senate across the country, they won't appear with the president. They won't say the Affordable Health Care Act or Obamacare by name. They're doing everything they can to distance themselves from the act. And Charlie Crist is running to it. 
That makes no sense to me. He doesn't really have a primary. You mentioned Nan Rich before. She's a delightful lady. Charlie Crist is going to win her street, right? <laughs> he's going to he's going to kill her in the primary because she has no statewide name ID and she has no money to get statewide name ID. He's running as if he were in a Democratic primary, while other Democrats around the country who are running for big offices like Senate are trying to separate themselves, he's embracing it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about embracing the future, George. Mm -hmm. At one point uh, in your public service career, you held the distinction as the youngest member of the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. You pondered a race, indeed got into a race again for the U.S. Senate, and then reassessed that. Tell us what you're up to these days. Well, I'm uh, privileged to be the chairman of a law firm here in Florida called uh, Gunster. We've got 11 offices across the state, and we get to serve our clients, and that's what pays the bills for me, and I'm excited to do that work. I also uh, have an affiliation with Palm Beach Atlantic University here in uh, Palm Beach County, Florida, where I have a center of public policy. And tomorrow night, George Will is going to come and speak with the students and with members of the community. If anyone who's uh, watching would like to attend that event, they can go to the Palm Beach Atlantic website and find out more information. And we're trying to create discourse in this community. Florida is such a young state. Mm. We're almost 20 million people. We're going to pass New York in population by the end of the year. Yet we don't have the institutions where real thoughtful debate exists. So we're trying to provide that at Palm Beach Atlantic. Thoughtful debate. About a minute left. You changed positions in terms of in-state tuition for, uh, mm -hmm. for children brought uh, to Florida illegally. Quickly, can you tell us why and why you believe in-state tuition is a good thing? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I didn't believe in it because I thought, well, here's a kid in Georgia or Alabama or North Carolina, another state who's here in this country illegally. Why should he have to pay out of state or she have to pay out of state tuition when a kid is here illegally in Florida would get a lower rate? And I, I realize that that's not the right question. The right question is under existing Supreme Court law, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade has to be provided for free if you are a student in this country, even if you are here illegally. But then when these kids, if they've gotten the grades to get into college, want to go into college, the price that we charge for out of state, even at a, a state college or community college, is three, four, five times as much. So you're basically saying to these kids who we've educated till 12th grade that they can't go to college. To me, that's not fair to them. It's not good for Florida. Well, this may be something we can debate either at your Institute of Public Policy or come back and see us because I may have a different view. You may on have that. a different view, Jenny. But we're glad to have you, George Lemieux, and we really appreciate your time. Thanks Great for having me on. We'll be back with more here on Newsmax TV. Of course, what do you think about this issue? of illegal immigrants getting in-state tuition in states like Florida. We'd love to hear from you. You can find our contact info on the screen. We'll be back with more after this.